Our parasha begins with the family of Gereshon. Gereshon was one of the sons of Levi. Actually, Levi had three sons. Gereshon, Kehat, and Merari. Gereshon being the eldest. You may ask a question. If Gereshon is the eldest... Why is he mentioned only in Parashat Naso, whereas his younger brother Kehat was already mentioned in Parashat Bamidbar? Let's review. The job of the Leviim was to transport the Mishkan, which was a portable uh, structure, a tabernacle that was carried with the Jewish people in the Midbar. So you needed, uh, you needed porters. So the Leviim were the porters of Klai Yisrael. They would carry the Mishkan. Each family was in charge of carrying different furnishings of the Mishkan. The Kahat family, for example, carried the Aron, the coveted Aron. Whereas the Gereshon family carried the curtains, the Idiot, the coverings. So again, the question is asked, in last week's Perasha, we read how the Kahat family carried the Aron. In our parasha, we learn how the Gereshon family carried the uh, Yiriot, the curtains and the skins. Question is asked by the Kli Akkad, if Gereshon was the firstborn, why not mention him first in last week's parasha? Why do they put Kehat before Gereshon? It's a fair question. If you don't mind, I'll read the Kli Akkad inside even. Hayalun limnot tichilat b'nei Gereshon abbechor. So he says, the Midrash answers this question. Because the preference why you choose Kehat first is because not who they were, but because what their job was. They carried the Aron. And the Aron was the most coveted furnishing in the Mishkan. But second Shekalim we learned, in the Aron you had four tablets. The two keepers and the two broken ones. And according to one opinion, you had also the separate Torah that Moshe Rabbeinu wrote was also in the Aron. So you're talking about a very, very holy uh, furnishing. So therefore the Midrash says, the reason why it picks the Kehat family first is because of not who they were, but because of what they carried. It's really a preference to the Aron. So ask the Kli Akad, he gufakasha. That's a question in itself. Why didn't they give the Gereshon family rights to carry the Aron? She says, the Midrash answered, oh, you know why you put Kehat first? Because they carry the Aron. That's our question. Put Gereshon first, but I didn't carry the Aron. I, I, I like this question. Many of you guys don't appreciate it, this question. This is, a, this, is a, this is a very strong question. And the answer is really the... the I, I can see from your face you're saying this is not value. I'm not getting value from this question. There's value in this question. Trust me, there's value. The lesson is to teach us respect for Tabidi Hakamim. In order to teach the people that they have to respect those that study Torah. And to give them all the honors and kavod first. So that's why it chose for Kehat first. Not because of who they were, but because of what they were doing. Because if the Pasuk would have put Gershon, you might have said, oh, you know why Gershon was listed first? Because of the Bechor. Ah, you, you missed the whole point. Which means, if Gershon would have carried the Torah, we would have looked at it reversely. We would have said, oh, you know why the Torah is being carried by Gershon? Because who Gershon is? Because Gershon is the Bechor. He says, no, it's the opposite. The Kavod is not that the person from his own status. It's the Torah that demands the Kavod. Hence he says, If you would have given the Aron to the Gereshon, Ha'iti Omer, Which means I would have said, 
Yeah, you know why they put Gideshon first? Because he's the Bechor. I wouldn't have thought because it's for Aaron. I would have gave the credit of Gideshon's listing first because he's the Bechor. I wouldn't have said because it's the Aaron. But now that you put Gehad carrying the Aaron, I say, hold it. You're not putting it in order of uh, birth. So it must be, would you put it first? Because of the Aaron. So using Gehad to carry the Aaron shows me the Kavod of the Aaron itself. And therefore he says that what? How much we see over here, the Aaron itself, which only housed the Luhot, how much kavod and how much um, um, reverence it deserves. God the Homini says, those that are studying Torah, the Luhot were inanimate. The Luhot were not alive, they didn't have uh, life to them. They were just a stone uh, with, uh, with words on them. But the Tabidiyah Hachamim, that interpret it, and study it, and deliver it, and offer it, certainly their kavod is even higher than the Aaron. The Pasuk says, Yekarahim Peninim, that the Torah is more precious than diamonds. But the Midrash learns, Yekarahim Peninim, Afilu Mekohen Gadol, Shenechnas Nefnaim V'Nefnim. Even from the Kohen Gadol that enters the Beit HaMikdash, once a year, B'Kdushah Torah, a tamid hakam amaaris, a tamid hakam amaaris, which we know is amaaris, which is a a, a tamid hakam can be amaaris. Tamid hakam Yisrael, a tamid hakam that's uh, Yisrael, and a kohen amaaris, tamid hakam Yisrael is better. Even though the kohen goes into the, I tell you even better, tamid hakam. I don't say this too loud. Tamid hakam mamzer, tamid hakam mamzer. Mm. Is better than a Kohen Gadol Amaharis. What do you mean? The Kohen Gadol Amaharis, he goes into the Holy of Holies. Doesn't matter if he's Amaharis. You don't have to take a, uh, an IQ test to go into the Kodesh Kodashim. You just have to show us your genes, and you have to have the hat on and the Shemesh Hashem and Hamishchan. You go into the Kodesh Kodashim. So if I would ask you, who gets pre- preference? A, a Tamir Hagan that came from a Mamzerut, from an adulterous relationship, or a Kohen Gadol Amaharis? Yakarahim Epininim. The Tamir Hagan takes precedence. Got to earn it, exactly. It's not just something that comes from, uh, from family. And therefore, if the Torah would have told us, get a shon, carrying the Aaron, you know what I would have said? Yeah, get a shon listed first because he's the Bechor. I wouldn't have looked at the Aaron. His Bechor would have eclipsed the Aaron's Kedusha. So therefore, I want to highlight the Aaron. So therefore, how do I do that? I put Kehat first. So I scratch my head and say, Kehat, what's Kehat doing here first? Ella must be, we're not going in order here. We're looking at the furnishings. In the Kiddushah of the Aaron precedes everybody else. There's a story told in the Nevi'im to show you how severe the Kiddushah of the Aaron is. Where David and Melech waged war against Pedishtim. Pedishtim had taken the Aaron into captivity. Uh, David and Melech uh, fought the Pedishtim and beat them. Pedishtim got scared. They put the Aaron in a wagon and they sent it back to Bnei Israel. A wagon without any driver. Because the animals themselves have got GPS. They know exactly where to go to return the Aaron to Am Yisrael. When the Jewish people saw the wagon coming, 30,000 people came out to greet the Aaron. And they took like a ticket tape parade, escorting the Aaron back to Yerushalayim. As it happened, it seems the wagon uh, lost its uh, footing, its traction, and the Aaron was about to fall off the wagon. A fellow by the name of Uzzah instinctively lunged forward to catch the Aaron. The moment his hands came from under Aaron, he died. The Navi tells us why. He was doing something in the Chavod of the Aaron. However, he forgot a very important halakha. The Aaron maintains itself. The Aaron does not need anybody to carry it. On the contrary, the Aaron carries those that carry it. If you looked at the Levim's feet when they were carrying the Aaron, they were off the ground. The Aaron is like a helicopter. It lifts the people up and it carries them. And therefore, to show you how severe the Kavod of the Aaron is here, they were trying to catch it out of Kavod. But since there was a little lack of respect, you don't understand the severity of this item. You don't come in. This is fire. You don't put your hands in a fire. This is Kedusha. Even if you came out of respect, but you forgot that the Aaron is... Is holier than holy. And therefore, Oza died. When David Amelech saw that Oza died, he said, Wow, this Aaron over here is a serious item over here. We don't want to take this back to Jerusalem so fast. This is, uh, the Aaron's in a bad mood. So he went and he gave the Aaron 
to uh, to a fellow by the name of Oved, and the Aaron stayed in Oved's house for three months, and it says Oved had a berachah in his house. His wife gave birth. His daughters-in-law gave birth. His children got married. Beracha, you can't believe it. From here we have the custom when somebody writes a sefer Torah that we bring the sefer Torah to the house. Why? Because the sefer Torah brings beracha to the house. It brings kedusha to the house. Look at what happened to the Oved's family became blessed. He had the court of the hundreds of children and grandchildren as a result of it. I mean, the beracha was endless. But I want to point out that many people think it's a big zechut to have the sefer Torah in the house, so they put the sefer there. So in the living room, everybody's looking at the sefer, and the guy's sitting in his den, and he has the plasma on, and the guy's watching, uh, you know, Gilu Ariot Shifkut Damim Arudah Zara. In the same way, which means if Uza, who came to try to help the Karun, which means his intention was not to defile the Arun, he tried to catch it, and what happened to him? He got zapped. So imagine God brings the Sefer Torah to his house, and in the same house, under the same roof, might be a better minhag not to bring the Sefer Torah to the house and leave it in the synagogue. In any event, David Melech, after three months, said, you know what? It seems Aaron is in a, is in a better mood. Let's bring it, uh, let's bring it to Yerushalayim. So they made a Sefer Torah dedication. It's the first Sefer Torah dedication in history. Ticket tape parade again, they closed off the streets, and they started to carry the Aron back from, Uz, from Oved's house to Yerushalayim. And in the uh, parade, David Melech was um, uh, very, very out of uh, king, king character, I'll call it. Normally the character of the king is, you know, he's walking, he's dignified, so to speak, he has a certain uh, protocol. Here it says, David was dancing and singing, he was clapping, he was jumping off the ground. I mean, he was elated and uh, exuberant in front of the Aron. His wife, Michal, uh, was not happy with David's, um, we'll call it, David's uh, uh, behavior in front of everybody. After all, he's the king of Israel. For him to be dancing like that, she felt it was a slight to his honor. So she called him on it. She says, what are you doing over here? She says, you're making yourself uh, cheap in front of the eyes of the people. David HaMelech says, Un kaloti od mizot. He says, in front of the Aron, I will lower myself even more. David HaMelech was saying, in front of the Aron, we're nobody. In front of the Aaron, even the king of Israel is invisible. In front of the Aaron, even the king of Israel is subjugated. There's nothing. I have no kavod in front of the Aaron. And the Pasuk writes, P.S. Michal, the daughter of Shul, did not have children till the day she died. And the Gemara says, why? Because she chastised David for dancing in front of the Aaron. And therefore, even if somebody makes a comment against the Aaron, already there's excises judgment. Then we have to be very, very careful. The Gemara says in Makot, these foolish Babylonians, they stand up in front of a Sefer Torah, but they don't stand up in front of a Tamid Hakam. Sefer Torah comes into the room, oh, everybody stands up, everybody kisses it, everybody hugs it, everybody adores it. However, Tamid Hakam is an animated Sefer Torah. And Tamid Hakam is, brings the Sefer Torah and the to life. He translates it, translates, he synthesizes it into real life. And therefore, the also when Tamir Hakam comes into the room, must afford it the same respect. And if that's the punishment that you get for mistreating the Aron, imagine the punishment you get for mistreating Tamir Hakamim. If a person comes along and the Gemara says that uh, a few relationships in life are dangerous. And one of the most dangerous and tenuous relationships is... A relationship that you have with a Tamir Hakam. Because a relationship with a Tamir Hakam can be very dangerous because the Gemara is a double edged sword. In one place it says, Take it for Tamir Hakam, Beracha. Mm-hmm. Immediately, whenever you associate yourself with a Tamir Hakam, there's Beracha. How do we know that from Yaakov Abinu? The second Yaakov Abinu moved to Lavan's house, he became wealthy. The second Yaakov moved to Misraim, the famine ended. Which means association to Tamir Hakam brings Beracha. But what? It's a double edged sword. A person gets very friendly with a Tamir Hakam. And then already he starts to become a little loose. 
And he becomes a little, hey, what's up, Rabbi? Hey, what's going on? How you doing? And he puts his arm around him. Hey, good to see you. What are you talking about over here? What are you doing over here? This is not your friend over here. There's a whole shayla if you're allowed to give Mishloach Manot to a rabbi. Because the Pasuk says, Mishloach Manot ish l'ri'ehu. To your, a man to his friend. Your rabbi is not your friend. So it's a whole question if you fulfill the obligation of Mishloach Manot, you give it to your rabbi. La Laka, we say, it's okay. But to show you how, how serious it is, therefore the Gemara has got to be very careful, because those people that get very close to me, sometimes you lose your, you know, the reverence towards them, and then Hafez Shalom, that is, Tamir Hakan is, you know, asking for, for punishment, it's fire. Which means the fire is, is, is burns you, Regardless, even a, 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 a fire uh, that uh, you're going to save somebody's life in it, it burns. That's the nature of fire. I mean, the fire doesn't say, what's well, this guy's doing a high city? I try to save somebody's life, I'm not going to burn it. That's to be out of a fire. Therefore, we have to be careful to mehazek our kavod for it. That's why the Torah starts off with kehat. Not because he was kehat. It's really starting off with the aron. And we didn't want you to think that we're starting off with gershon because he was gershon the bechon. And that's an important lesson. I, I said this yesterday. So one of the, the uh, people in the class made a good point. He says, if that's the case, how unfortunate is it that you have people in the Kahal that um, when they get an aliyah to the Sifat Torah, so they get slighted if they didn't get the proper aliyah. When your kabod is more than the kabod of the Sifat Torah, when you're putting yourself higher than the Sifat Torah, it's not about the guy who gets the Aliyah. It's about the Sefer Torah. The guy who gets the Aliyah is just an incidental. Which means, you know, the guy's thinking, yeah, the reason why they take it out the Sefer Torah is to respect me. So I can get the most covered Aliyah. Oh, it's not about you. The Sefer Torah is Kavod. The Sefer Torah is Kavod. If you get to go up to the Sefer Torah in any capacity, if it's a Reke of a Reke, bottom line, you're getting to make the Merakan, you get to stand next to the Sefer Torah for a few minutes, you should pay all the money in the world for that honor. Instead, a person comes out and says, Do you know who I am? What do you mean? You think you're better than the Sefer Torah? You're not better than the Sefer Torah. The Sefer Torah's honor is greater than your honor. And therefore, we have to be very careful not to make ourselves larger than the Sefer itself. Yeah, the very... No, no, not at all. He doesn't say that. He just says that, equal. yeah, it could be that we're equal. Just so we don't want you to make a mistake and think it was Gershon first. It was the Aron first. It was the Aron first. I thought also that he got a greater reward. Because he learned. He I, th- on because I thought he was going to say that to Kli Yatan. He, uh, he doesn't mention that. There's a lot to be a raya for the kavod of the Tamit Chacham. He's the one that. Yeah, yeah, no, that's a raya. It's raya for the kavod of the Tamit Chacham. That's the kavod that goes out of the Tamit Chacham. Right. Kavachomet to those that interpret the Aron. Right. Yikarahim ipininim. Would that would that also the couple of verses ago they talked about the the curses? It's like a custom uh, in Below. areas that they don't uh, they don't want to get that aliyah because they think that correct, correct. We believe hundred percent. Be every aliyah is good. Every aliyah. I also don't want the curses between me, <laughs> but every aliyah is good. So we have the shame next year. Come to us, we'll give you the curses. Uh, oh. But with the berachot as well. Your curses are good. <laughs> no, the truth is, our custom is before we read the curses, we don't start from the curses. We start from the berachot. So you get berachot also. Okay. Further. Oh. <laughs> we have time for one more, boys? I'm joking. Just got it. Okay. If you look in the uh, Pedic here, most people don't realize that there's a very important mitzvah in this week's Pedasha. If I were to ask you, where is the mitzvah of Teshuvah mentioned in the Torah? Repentance. That's something so basic. Teshuvah has got to be mentioned in every perasha from Vayikra on. No, it's not. One of the few sources of the mitzvah of repentance is in Parashat Naso. Buried in the 176 Pesukim, you have one Pesuk over here, Pesuk uh, uh, Perik, He Pesuk Zayin, Vitvadu et Chattatam, and the people will confess their sins, Asher Asu, Veshivit Ashawab and Oshon, they'll return the stolen goods, Mahabishito, Yosif Allah, they have to pay a vig, Venatan Ashir Ashamlu. So Vitvatu et Chattatam, from here we learn the mitzvah of confessing one's sin. The mitzvah of Teshubah.
I quote you Harabam's language. Kol mitzvot sheba Torah ben ase ben lo taase. Im adar adam al achat mehem ben bezadon ben bezgaga kishi ase teshuva v'yashuv mechito chayav letvadot. If a person transgresses, whether it's a positive or a negative commandment, whether he does it on purpose or whether he does it unintentionally, he must confess shene emar v'tvadu et chatatam asher asu. Zeu vidu nevarim. In this parasha, you have the law of confession. The whole law of Kippur is from this pasuk over here. This, this is like a, a sleeper item over here. It's a little cushion between this whole situation, and you're learning a very important cloud. But in what context was this pasuk written? It was written in the context of a law of thievery. What's the case? A guy borrowed something, and the lender lent it for a certain purpose but the borrower used it for a different purpose so even though he got permission to use it but since he's using it for a different purpose the Torah says that's tantamount to thievery example guy says can I borrow your car yeah, what do you want to do with the car uh, I want to drive to, uh, to the city all right, so the guy says to the city, all right, no problem, you drive to the city, go. And all of a sudden, the guy comes back, and he says, by the way, thank you for your car. Where were you? I drove up Mount Everest. Oh, I drove up Mount Everest. I didn't, I didn't give you the car to drive up Mount Everest. The, uh, the clutch, the brakes, you, you, you stripped the whole uh, the car. But did you, didn't you lend me your car? Yeah, I lent you your car to go to the city. I didn't lend you your car to climb uh, Mount, uh, Mount Hope. So therefore, the Torah says that is tantamount to what? To stealing so the Mephashim is the Admor from Gur asks, why specifically in this context is the Mitzvah of Teshuvah mentioned? The Mitzvah of Teshuvah could have been mentioned in any Mitzvah. Don't eat Taref. Oh, and on the day that you eat Taref, you'll confess your sin and you'll uh, make Teshuvah. Oh. Why specifically over here in the context of thievery, which is the context of the Peshuvah before it, does the Torah tell us, and you'll confess your sin? So he says a beautiful explanation. He says, our body does not belong to us. Our body was actually loaned to us from God. It's property of Hashem, the Bara. That's why, for example, we're not allowed to take a tattoo. I says, why not? I want to tattoo my body. You're right. But it's not your body to decide what you want to do with it. But Minan, the doctors want to take an autopsy and cut the body open. Can't cut the body up. Why not? We want to study it. Uh, why he died, diseases, and all that. Very good. Only one problem. It doesn't belong to you. Just like you can't go walk into somebody's house with a knife and start cutting open his couch. You say, what are you doing over here? I want to see what type of materials inside. You're a ganav over here. I want to see: is it down? Is it goose down? Or is it uh, synthetic? But you ruined the guy's couch. It doesn't belong to you. So for a doctor to come along and start cutting open a body on an autopsy, hey. It's not your body to cut up, it belongs to God. So you walk into somebody's out with, a, with, 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 a, with a, uh, a, 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 a can of paint and a paintbrush, and you start painting the guy's, uh, the guy's for you. What are you doing over here? Ah, I thought it looked nice and, uh, you know, uh, fluorescent green. What are you talking about? This is, my, this is my house over here. Guy puts a tattoo on his arm. But well, that's not your property to go start putting... Uh, now, even if a guy would come on and say, but I want to put uh, Yudke you know, on my arm, I want to put the, what is the Shemot? The same thing, can I, can I walk and uh, go to your car, and on your hood, write, uh, you know, Shem Shin Dalit Yud, uh, on your car? Of course not, it's, it's, it's not your property. So God, God gave us the body. He lent it to us. He gave us the hands to do mitzvot with them, to do chesed, to give charity. He gave us our legs in order to run to synagogue. He gave us our eyes in order to read the Vre Torah. He gave us our ears in order to listen to the Vre Torah. He gave us our mouth in order to pray and serve Him. And all the different limbs were given to us on condition. As a matter of fact, the Gemara Nida says that when the child is born, a Malach comes and tells the child, Shibu'ah I'm making you make a swear. Promise us or swear to us that you're going to be a tzaddik and not a rasha. And every child, when he comes out of the womb, he has to make a swear. I swear I'll be a tzaddik. And therefore, every uh, child 
that comes out and commits Averot for breaking the swear. That's why one rabbi said, we open up Kippur, we're absolving ourselves from all the vows and all the shu. How many times do you make swears during the year? You ever make a swear in your life? We don't swear anymore. The explanation is we're coming to God and say, please absolve us from the swear that we made when we were coming out of our mother's womb that we swore to you that we're going to be a tzaddik. Unfortunately, this year we were, we were far from a tzaddik and therefore we broke the swear. And therefore everybody's in contempt of Shavuot. The Bhattarani that he was very important because we all break the swear every day. Therefore we have to ask absol- absolvance from that Shavuot that we made from the womb. In any event, what happens? We come into this world, and instead of using our hands for mitzvot, we use our hands l'ra'a. Either we use it for violence, or we use it uh, to steal, or we use our legs. Instead of running to the Vayish of Yarutsu. Their legs run for evil. And instead of their eyes looking at the Vretorah, then the now their eyes are looking at things that they're not supposed to look at. And instead of using the ears to hear the Torah, they're running to hear Lashon Aran, gossip, and all sorts of uh, uh, things that are forbidden. And instead of their mouth uh, spitting out the Torah and Tefillah, it's spitting out the Varim of lies and false flattery and ingesting the Varim Asurim as well. And therefore, we're in contempt. We're like that thief. We're borrowing things from God, but we're using it for the different, uh, different purpose. God says, I gave you this item on loan, and you're using it for something that it wasn't intended to. So technically, as ethical we think we are. You know, we're talking about people, this guy's a thief, this guy got caught, you know, with fraud, and this guy's a robber, and this guy's dishonest, and this guy's not... Unfortunately, we're all, to a certain extent, thieves. Because we also borrowed something from somebody from God and we're using it for the wrong purpose. And then the Torah specifically says, you know where the mitzvah of Teshuvah is? On thievery. Because every Avera technically is theft. Because you're using the body for a purpose that it was not created for. Hence there is no better place to mention the mitzvah of Teshuvah than in the mitzvah of theft. Because every sin also has in it Gezel. That's why if you look at the Vidui, most of the Vidui is Gezel. Gazanu, Ganavnu, uh, 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 they did a, uh, Rabbi Matadel Salman did a, um, a study on it, and he came out the majority of the sins in the Vidui are all related to uh, monetary or, or, or monetary sins as such. And the first one is what? Ganavnu. Because Ashavnu Bagadnu is general. The first sin then starts off. We stole. Why is that the most severe? This you guy think this? I never stole anything. I'm not, what am I a bank robber? What am I involved in? Uh, in fraud? I'm uh, basically an honest guy. And the guy said, pounding his chest, gonna have eh, That's not me. No. Every sin is is involved in geneva. So what does the Torah say? Besides confessing, you have to return it. Teshuva means to return, meaning it's not enough to say I sin, but you have to recommit yourself to use your body for kedusha. Use the limbs that God gave you for the proper purpose that it was lent to you from Bodhi Alam. It should be pointed out that the, well, as we told to the ladies, it's easier to tell it to the men than it was to tell the ladies, obviously, what I would tell you now. That being said, the human body itself has value only because. It houses the neshama. Uh, the physical body itself really has no worth. It's physical. But you need a physical in order to maintain the spiritual. Without a physical body, the neshama cannot live. That's why at the time of death, the neshama gets evicted from the body. And then when the body remains, and the neshama now takes on a different, uh, a different existence. If that's the case... Every human body has kedusha, has kedusha to it, because of what's within it. One rabbi compared the human body, the physical body, to the case of a sefer Torah. A case of a sefer Torah has no value. It's a case. Why is it different than a uh, than a cup, a styrofoam cup? The difference is because it houses a sefer Torah. So because of what's inside of it, it gives the sefer Torah case kedusha. Now. What I explained to them is that 
Nobody would ever dream to defile the case of a Sefer Torah. Imagine if somebody would come to the synagogue and he has a bag of apples. Nice. And the bag of apples breaks. As he going to carry the apples home. So he opens up the Sefer Torah. He takes out the scrolls. They have a case. It's a phenomenal case. He puts all the apples in the case of the Sefer Torah and he carries them home. What would we do to this guy? This guy would be banned from the community. This guy is a shock. You're using the Sefer Torah case to, to, to carry your groceries home? Or another lady comes to class, she has a baby, the baby starts crying, she didn't bring a stroller. She said, you know what, let me take this Sefer Torah case. She takes it, puts the baby in the Sefer Torah case, and like a cradle. Yeah. Hey, what are you, crazy? Using a Sefer Torah case for, for personal use? Our body is like the case of a Sefer Torah. And on Shabbat, all the more so, because we have two Neshavot in us on Shabbat, so therefore it's a double barrel. You have, you know, your, your body has extra Kedushah. All the more so, how carefully, just like we would never dream to use the Sefer Torah case for something that it wasn't intended for, all the more so our bodies. That we have to be so careful, we would never bring a Sefer Torah case to a place that it shouldn't be. Our bodies are just like that situation as well. But to the ladies, I told them, imagine, you take out a Sefer Torah from the Hecha, Bar Minnan, Bar Minnan. It's a mashal, of course, it never happens. You take out the Sefer Torah, and somebody lined the case of the Sefer Torah with all provocative pictures. Now, all of a sudden, you take out the Sefer Torah, the guy has Julian. She might say, what's going on over here, Ben Minan? Somebody draped the Sefer Torah in, 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 in modest uh, clothes and all this over here. This is, uh, I, I, I'm, I'm sad to say that that, that shoe will probably have 100% attendance uh, the, the following week over there. You know, the Julian will be the highest. Uh, yeah, right. You get, get a good price for Julian over there. Each guy's going to want to get Julian. But all jokes aside, we will be mortified. I think even the Mahalel Shabbat, the joke to Sulan on Shabbat. Oh, of course. Yeah, this, this is unacceptable. They, they, what do you, this is a Sefer Torah. If, if, if there's one thing that's holy, let me know when a lady dresses immodestly. That's what you're doing. That's what you're doing. You're taking the Sefer Torah case and you're putting all uh, 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 promiscuity on the case of the Sefer. Your body wasn't given to you to flaunt. The body was given to you in order to use for Torah and Mitzvot. But when a person now changes the intended purpose for something else. Now I'm going to show it off to get kavod, to get honor. This is a problem. Now, I'm going to tell you the end of the story over here. In the ladies' case, I couldn't tell them the end of the story. You know, they were clamoring to hear the end of the story, but I know they clamor to hear the end of the story, and they're going to hold it against me that I told the end of the story. So I, I, I held back the end. But for the men, I'll tell you the end, because you clamor anyway on anything we say here, so it doesn't matter. You want me to clamor on the easy stuff. It's okay, that's worth the space. I don't know, his own risk. The subject was like this. The Gemara says in Tarit, there was a rabbi called Rabbi Yosef the Minyokrat. He had a house. He had a fence around his house. He comes home, and he sees there's a guy piercing a hole through the fence of Rabbi Yosef's house. So Rabbi Yosef says, hey, fellow, what's, what's the big idea over here? He says, no, Hakam, you forgive me, I'll be sure. But your daughter is so beautiful, I'm, I got I to look in to see uh, your uh-huh. daughter. I mean, this is like a, a, a peeping tom, uh-huh. we call that. Uh, there's no new sins, by the way. Every sin... Is, He's yeah, recorded it. Whatever sins they have today, uh, <laughs> they the haven't form. figured out new sins. It's all the same old stuff, just you know, recycled in different forms. I got, I got a case of a peeping tom. The guy's looking through the, uh, through the, through the wall. So what is the meal sin? You figure the meal sin... You prosecute the guy. Right. Call well, the uh, cops. Uh, you pervert. You know, you look into the thing over there. Put him in jail. Put his name on the internet. You know. Correct. He's a, he's a, what do you call it? A, uh, 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 put him in the press. Oh, yeah, put him in the press. And now, let us, everybody, be careful. We got a, uh, you know, a, uh, a pet, what do they call him? A uh, offender, uh, you know, uh, 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 a thing. Instead, he does the unimaginable. He goes into his house and he tells his daughter, we have a problem. Your beauty is a stumbling block for the people. And it's not good. People are getting uh, affected here negatively by your beauty. So she says, so what do we got to do? So he says, uh, you got to leave. That's according to one version. And according to one version of the Gebarah, she, she died. She died. He died. He died. It's an amazing thing. He, he, and she, it seems, and yeah, this is what we have to do, is we have to, which means 
I'm not uh, saying that this is a course of action for today, but they understood what modesty was. That if a lady is causing others to trip up in this over here, the Hatam Sofer's either his wife or his mother, something to the Hatam Sofer. It was a very pretty lady. Very, very pretty. And because of that, she really wouldn't leave the house so much because she didn't want to. She got a beautiful glow and an aura. One day she left the house for something and she heard the men, they were talking. Wow, how beautiful this lady is. She got very upset. She got very upset. Uh, today, if a lady would hear this over there, she, she would live in the middle of the street. She wouldn't, she wouldn't go home. She would live in the street over there. Phenomenal. She, 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 she'd walk around the street with a tape recorder to tape all these uh, compliments. So what happened? She comes home, the wife of the Hatam so finished, she starts crying in the Tehillim. The Hatam says, what are you crying about? I'm praying that Borel should take away my beauty. Oh my God. Why? It's too, it's too much for the people. So my Hatam says, that's the chut, Borel will answer you and all your beauty will be in your children. And sure enough, shortly after she got pregnant, and from the pregnancy uh, image changed, she lost some of the beauty, and sure enough, she had all her children, we know the Hatam Sufi's descendants, they were all Hasidim, Sadiqim, Tehorim. So you see over here to the extent of in the olden days what a Jewish woman would uh, go to not to defile her body. Except for that case, therefore they have to have a certain measure of, uh, of modesty. That being said, our Torah tells us in Perasha, the law of Sota. Which is a good segue into the Sota law. Used to be, uh, years back, when the rabbi would talk about Sota, uh, you were talking about a husband that suspected his wife for a little impropriety. Uh, then two witnesses come along and say, we saw your wife secluded with that guy that you suspected. Now the husband uh, doesn't know if she's innocent, is she guilty. Uh, she's guilty off the bat. And, uh, you know, Just to be secluded with another man that's not your husband, even if all they were doing was playing toilet, they were playing checkers, still... That's Avon. You don't, you don't go seclude yourself with, uh, with another person. But the Torah says, you got to go to the Beit HaMikdash, you got to drink the waters. If she's innocent of the crime of adultery, she's blessed. If she's guilty, she blows up. So it's an adulterous situation. So in the olden days, when the rabbi would teach this, this is more in the hypothetical. He said, okay, this is one of those things we learn it, but uh, it's not no gaya. This doesn't happen. Unfortunately, in the community today, uh, not only the community, the world today, adultery has become another form of marriage, which means there's different marriages. You have a marriage between man and wife, and then by Manan you have now the alternate style that they're preaching today. Now another style of marriage has become a monogamous marriage, but with with adultery. And that's a, that's a derech, which means we're it's, it's accepted already, an accepted practice in some circles. So, but uh, this unfortunately is no more uh, hyperbole. This over here is halakhalama said these cases. The question is, what brings the lady to a sota? What makes her a sota? So, the Torah might allude to it when it says, Ish, Ish, ki teste ishto. The rabbis ask, mean, ish, ish. A man, a man, that his wife becomes a sota, she sways. So one of the Baalim Musar says that Harambam writes, a man is obligated to love his wife like he loves himself and honor his wife more than himself. What does it mean, honor more than himself? Which means if you have only a hundred dollars and you can either buy yourself a new pair of shoes or your wife a pair of shoes, doesn't exist a pair of shoes for a wife for a hundred dollars. You can buy your wife a. Uh, you can buy anything for your wife for a hundred dollars these days over there. As a down payment, maybe. A down payment to a, to a shoe, maybe. The point is, for instance, down payment for one shoe. The point is, it goes to your wife. Like, even though it's your kavod to have new clothes, and it's her kavod to have new clothes, which means you have to give the kavod more to the wife. And therefore, the Rambam is giving us the secret of a good marriage. Love as much as yourself. It's hard to love somebody more than you love yourself. Because everybody loves themselves a lot. So if you can love somebody else equal to yourself, that's already a great accomplishment. But when it comes to giving kavod, 
their kavod of the wife comes before your own kavod. Ah, oh, so that being said, let's say you have a man that is egocentrical, which means he's selfish. All he cares about is himself, to gratify himself and to satisfy himself. And his wife receives no sensitivity, no care, no love. It's all about him. He's the uh, self-centered person in the relationship. What's going to happen to this wife? She's going to have to search in other places for affection, for love, and for care. And the Torah tells us, if the husband in their marriage is ish ish, which means he holds himself, he's not one ish. He's ish, ish, I'm the man, I'm, I'm in charge, I do everything. And the wife is really non-existent. Usually in the marriage it's ish, ish, ah. Correct. But in this case it's ish, ish. It means he just sees himself. Okay, you know what the Torah says? Yeah. In such a case of ish, ish, the digression is going to be that you're going to force your wife because of your self-centered behavior and nature to cause her to go to other places in order to search for what she's missing in the house. As the Torah is giving us a great lesson over here, how a husband sometimes to be the cause of the adulterous relationship. Last but not least, last but not least, the Torah does tell us uh, towards the end of the parasha about the different korbanot, the sacrifices that the Nisi'im brought. On the first 12 days of the uh, Mishkan inauguration, every day another tribe wrote a korban. That's why there's so many pesukim in this week's parasha, because it's repeating the 12 korbanot of the Nisi'im. Inaugural korbanot. So the Ramban over here in the parasha. You know what? I'm not embarrassed. I can read you the Ramban. I read you the Kliya Khan inside. Why can't I read you the Ramban? But I know what you guys are thinking. Just tell it to us outside, Rabbi. You don't have to read it inside. I'm going to read it inside anyway. <laughs> no, I know. I know exactly the way these guys think. Here. Ramban. Phenomenal. Vanachon. Betaram katuv. The reason why the Pasuk has to write it 12 times over. You could have just written the first Nasi and then Ibid. You know what Ibid is? Ibid means same as above. You know, put, put, put the marks. And the other 11 brought the exact same Qurban as the first. Why did you have to tell me the same Pesukim over and over? Because the Kadosh Baruch Hu gives kavod to those that fear Him. Because those that respect me, God gives them kavod. And He says, It wanted to list them by name. And it wanted to tell us exactly the Quran they brought. Lo shi askin v'yichabet etarishon. That's like you just tell us the first one. Zeh korban nachshon ben amin adahad v'yomar v'chen hikribu anisri'im ish ish yomo. And then the person will say, and so too did the others. Ki yeze kitsur b'chavod ha'achirim. Because that would take away the kavod of the other tribes. Do you know how uh, uh, frugal... Our Torah is when it comes to extra letters and extra words and extra ink. If there's an extra dot in the Torah, the rabbis go wild. Whoa, what is this doing? We could have done without it. We didn't need it. We could have used it for something. And the Gemara struggles to find, why is there an extra Yud? You could have done without it. And here, you don't have an extra Yud. You have an extra 50, 60 Pesukim. All repetitious. No Derash. Just repetitious. Why Ramban says? in order not to slight another person. Because if you brought a korban after Nachshon, and you got kavod, the rabbi gets up at the pulpit and says, Rabotai, we're now going to announce the pledges uh, for, the, uh, for the people. Mr. So-and-so, one million dollars, 
And uh, there's a list also of another 11 people that also gave the a million as well, the school of Mitzvot. So the other 11 say, hey, oh, <laughs> this guy, they say his name, Allah Mubaruk, they announce it and all that. When it comes to the other ones, they say, uh, these guys also, they're also a uh, million. But don't say their names even. So the Torah says, oh, no, no, not Kavod. If you're giving Kavod to one, you have to give Kavod to all of them. I think there's an important lesson that we have to learn over as we come to the season of graduation. I myself don't have a school. But I uh, can imagine that this problem occurs. This is a time of year where the schools give out awards for different accomplishments over the course of uh, their tenure in elementary or high school. Uh, valedictorian, salutatorian, uh, you have uh, leadership awards, etc. You know, the, the award from the government, from the politician and all that. Now, imagine you have a class of 16 kids or 27 kids, whatever it may be, and, you know, 22 of them get awards. So you have five kids sitting in the class that are not worthy of an award. How embarrassing. How embarrassing is it for those five kids or four kids that now everybody comes out with a diploma and something under their arm at least gets to walk up the stage a second time and shake hands with the uh, administration and here this child just sits in front of all the parents in front of all the teachers in fact, what a busha uchlima it's one thing if you have 30 kids and 4 people get awards ok, 4 people, that's already the large minority so the elite are getting awards, everybody else understands these were the special kids but once already, you're creating awards, you know, this guy, the best personality award, we're giving this guy over here, you know, the Howard Golden Award, you know, the little guy from uh, the, the borough president, they bring the guy down, he gives him some uh, paper, today we're calling it, uh, uh, the Tuesday, of June 8th is officially Rabbi Eli Mansour Day, we announced it in the Congress, okay, he gets an award over there, and he takes a picture and all that, and they put it in the uh, newspaper. But if you're giving awards for every single little thing, you better see to it that everybody gets some sort of award. Otherwise, don't give any awards, just to the, to the few. That's what Torah is telling If the Torah is going to write 12 times, 12 times, this is, by the way, you talk about precious real estate, there's no more precious real estate than the cloth of the Sefer Torah. And it's very, very, like I said, the Torah is very, very uh, 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 miserly when it comes to spending ink. And here the Torah says, write it. Even if we have to write the longest parasha in the Torah, do it, because we don't want to slight the other 11. Koshikin, imagine if the Torah would have written 11 and left out the 12th. Right. Or the more so, how much? Which means in this case, if only one guy got the kavod, and you leave out 11, the 11 can say, oh, listen, uh, he got it, he's special, he's Nachson, Ben Amin Adav, Yehuda, okay, so we're all in the same boat. But imagine if the Torah would have written 11 and left one, or the more so, what a slight that would be. Have a food for thought that the next graduation you go, something you can heckle the, uh, the principal with when they uh, give awards to everybody and they leave out. If you just imagine if your child was that child, from the minority that did not get the award. Baruch Adonai Olam. They did it.